At the core of each person, there is a desire and yearning for God. They can deny it and suppress this yearning for Him and live an unfulfilled life. But God has made it so that we all have a conscience, a conscience that is moved, pricked, and disturbed when it hears the gospel message. Why is the human conscience disturbed when it hears the gospel message? Because it knows the gospel message is true. When people hear that there is a God who created the heavens and earth, their conscience tells them that it is true. When people hear that everything was created by God Almighty and that everything couldn't have been here by accident and the world and all its complexities could not have formed by happenstance, their conscience tells them that it is true. When people hear that God created them, that He formed them, that He designed them in His own image, and that human beings are not animals and are not a mishap of the evolutionary process, their conscience tells them that this is true. When people hear that the universe in all its vastness and intricacy has a design and purpose beyond mere chaos, their conscience tells them that this is true. When people hear that the moral compass ingrained within them, the sense of right and wrong, is not a mere social construct, but an inbuilt directive given to them by a divine creator, their conscience tells them that this is true. When people hear that the love they feel, the hope they grasp, and the faith they cling to have roots deeper than mere human emotion and sentiment, their conscience tells them that this is true. When people hear that the cries of their heart, the longing for purpose and meaning, are answered by a God who seeks a personal relationship with them, their conscience resonates with agreement. When people hear that every sunrise they witness, every breath they take, and every moment they cherish are gifts from a loving God who knows them intimately, their conscience tells them that this is true. When people hear that the God who created this universe and humanity, therefore, expects His creation to love Him and obey the laws He has set in His universe, their conscience tells them that this is true. But why do people fight with their conscience if they know this is true? The answer is simple. The gospel message reveals that we are all guilty. Who wants to hear that they are guilty? That's why people suppress the gospel message, because it points the finger at each of us and tells us that we are all guilty and have fallen short of the laws of this infinite God. He has set requirements that we haven't met. And their conscience tells them that all of this is true and that God requires we love one another because all humans are made in the image of God and are therefore special in the eyes of God. When people hear that God requires us to love Him with all our heart, soul, and mind, and that the proof of this love is seen in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, they resist. People don't like what their conscience tells them because they know they haven't kept His commandments. They know they haven't obeyed His laws and are guilty. They've offended and disobeyed an eternal, infinite God. They are guilty, but they suppress this truth. Because, truth be told, who wants to know that an everlasting God is angry with them? Who wants to know that every one of their actions, thoughts, and deeds will one day be scrutinized? Who wants to know that all your sins will be judged and the punishment for them is everlasting because you have offended an everlasting God? Who wants to confront the notion of spending eternity in the lake of fire? Who wants to know that their every mistake will be recorded for posterity? Who wants to know that the secrets they whispered in the dark will one day be revealed? Who wants to know that the choices they made in youth could haunt them in eternity? When people's conscience tells them there is a God, they know it is true. Yet have you ever asked yourself why people reject this call, this call that follows them, telling them they are not living right, telling them they will have to answer one day for their sins? Why do they reject this call? The answer is simple, they love their sin. John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. People walk away because they love their deeds. They love darkness rather than light. They love their sins. Deep in their hearts, Many know that the gospel message is true and that God demands holiness from them, but they love their sins and are not willing to walk away from them and repent. To cope, they find it easier to walk away from their faith. Christ's death is God's gift to save men from perishing. But if man perishes, it is because he loves darkness rather than light. How easy it is to love darkness. 
His deeds are evil and all that darkness brings with it is evil. The evil in the world today exists for this very reason. Men love darkness rather than light. Mankind has a tendency to prefer the dark over the light. They love darkness for what it hides. The dark conceals their secret sins, their sinful pleasures, and their wrongdoing. They do not want others to know about their wickedness. All the light in this world is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Without Him, the world would be consumed by darkness, evil, and sin. Anything good in this world exists because of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel confronts men and women about their wickedness, but many do not wish to face their transgressions. The Gospel shines a light on human malevolence, but people love their darkness because they cherish their evil. Jesus Christ is the light. As the world seems to deteriorate, it is primarily because humanity increasingly rejects the light. The Church must recognize the era in which it exists. Christians live in a time of darkness and it's crucial for them to awaken. I have said all of this to come to this point. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There are several salient verses in the scriptures that we often do not pay good attention to, and this passage is one of them. Embedded in its lines are mysteries that have eternal relevance. Well, this teaching will help us bring back to mind the great power of God that is unleashed for our salvation and also help us appreciate God for the great grace that counted us worthy to be numbered among the saved. Our salvation is the greatest gift of God to mankind. Unfortunately, not everyone will accept it. What 1 Corinthians 1.18 tells us is that there are two groups, those who are perishing and those who are saved. The Bible reminds us of these two groups through Scripture, and even on Judgment Day there will be these two groups. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Like Paul, we must not be ashamed of the gospel, knowing that it is the power of God to save sinners. Irrespective of how ardent a sinner may be, the power of the gospel can bring him or her to their knees, bowing down to the Lordship of Christ. Those of us who have been saved must rise to the challenge of preaching the gospel of Christ to the lost, reconciling them to God. The truth is that we have been saved to save others, and we must not default in this assignment. The preaching of the cross only became foolishness to those that are perishing because the devil tries to stand against their salvation. When the veil covering their minds is removed, they would become great vessels in the hands of God. There are sinners that if they give their lives to Christ, they will cause great havoc to the kingdom of darkness. This was the case with Apostle Paul. You know how greatly God used him to advance the kingdom of Christ. Imagine if Apostle Paul was never converted. We must not give up on sinners. They could become great kingdom pillars if they get saved. The great commission which Jesus gave to us before his departure from the earth must not be taken lightly, especially as we can see that the signs of the end are being fulfilled. God is in control. Hebrews 13 verse 5 and 6 Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Regardless of your present condition or situation, God is in control. He knows you by name and He knows your pain and heartfelt desire. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loves you with a love that is unique. He cares about you in ways that your mind can comprehend. He hears your cry. He sees all you are going through. And He has not forgotten you. Close your eyes for a moment and just hear the voice of the Lord speaking to you, telling you, I love you. I love you. I 
love you. I love you. Close your eyes for a moment and hear the voice of the Lord telling you that you are mine. You are my child. You belong to me. No one loves you the way God loves you. I sometimes feel sorry for unbelievers and for what they go through without God. At the point of death of an unbeliever, I am sure they are gripped with fear. Fear of not knowing what is coming next. Fear of not knowing what awaits after death. Fear of the flames of hell. But that is not what happens for a child of God. A child of God experiences death with no fear because they know where they are going. They know who they are going to spend eternity with. Revelations 21 verse 1 to 4 And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. For all eternity God will be your God. That is something to look forward to. God will be your God. That is a future to look forward to. God will be your God. That is what awaits you after death. Five decisions that will send you to hell. Choices have consequences, and this is a truth we encounter at every turn of our existence. A truth embedded in the very fabric of our being. In every breath we draw, in every step we take, the echo of this reality resounds. Choices have consequences. We are architects of our destinies, molding our futures and our eternities with the decisions we make today. The choices you make in this life will determine where you will be 1,000 years from now, 10,000 years from now, 100,000 years from now. In the sanctity of God's wisdom, He granted us the gift of free will a profound responsibility to choose our paths, to make decisions that draw us closer to His divine love or push us away into eternal darkness. It is in this realm of choice that our spirits are refined, our characters are shaped, and our eternities are sealed. Choices have consequences. Now, the gravity of our decisions and the impact they have, not only on our earthly lives, but our eternal destinies are immeasurable. We stand at the crossroads of eternity every day, making decisions that echo into the realms beyond our mortal comprehension. The choices we make can be a beacon of light guiding us to the everlasting embrace of our Creator, or they can be chains that drag us into the very abyss of eternal separation. Choices have consequences. The Bible, time and time again, underscores the immense power and the eternal weight of our decisions. The Bible gives us real-life examples of men and women whose choices became the vehicles of blessings or the bearers of divine judgment. It's a timeless truth that crosses from the gardens of Eden to the visions of Revelation, whispering to our souls, choices have consequences. Today, we traverse the sacred scriptures to unearth the profound truth embedded in the decisions we make. 
we will delve deep into the divine word to unravel five decisions that will send you to hell. It's not a message of fear, but a loving warning, a beacon illuminating the paths that lead away from eternal joy and divine communion. Indeed, the profundity of the phrase, choices have consequences, echoes through the annals of time, whispering eternal truths that weave through the fabric of our existence. It is a principle so simple, yet so monumental, unfolding the fabric of humanity's story from the dawn of creation. Reflect, if you will, on the pristine gardens of Eden, where the first breaths of humanity danced in harmony with the Creator's breath. Here, Adam and Eve, the progenitors of our race, faced a choice, a decision whose shadows would stretch across generations, altering the very core of human existence. Their choice, the decision to rebel, to partake of the forbidden, fell into a deluge of sorrow, pain, and separation. Every pain, every heartbreak, every tear shed in the silent corners of the night can all be traced back to that moment in the garden, where choices etched consequences into the heart of humanity. It's a vivid, heartbreaking display of the repercussions of our decisions. It's an eternal echo, reminding us of the transformative power of our choices. I ponder sometimes on Eve, the mother of all living. Her heart, once beating in the light of Eden, now shadowed by the pain of loss and death. The narrative of Cain and Abel, the first death, the first murder. Oh, how it must have pierced her soul. How the air must have grown heavy with the suffocating silence of loss. The Bible does not narrate to us Eve's reactions, her silent screams, her tears of agony upon witnessing the horrifying consequences of her and Adam's choices. We do not read of her heart rending at the sight of Abel's lifeless form, the realization dawning upon her that her choice birthed this world of sorrow. Could you imagine, in those moments of sorrow, as she learned of Abel's death, the weight of the consequences fully revealed, the horror, the regret flooding her being, the truth, stark and haunting, revealing that the choices made in the garden birthed a legacy of pain, death, and separation. The echoes of that one choice reverberating through time, whispering in the wind, choices have consequences. Choices, those seemingly insignificant moments of decision, carry grave consequences. Choices, they wield the power to build or destroy, to bless or curse, to uplift or shatter. Choices are literally, literally, the difference between heaven and hell. Decisions 1 and 2, rejecting Christ as Savior and ignoring the Word of God. John 3:18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Oh, my dear friends, the crossroads are laid bare before us. Rejecting Christ, the Redeemer, the Savior, is a perilous decision, a pathway that leads to eternal condemnation. It's not a journey into the unknown. It's a deliberate stride into acknowledged separation from the Most High. It is the rejecting of the everlasting arms that have been stretched out to us, offering salvation, offering refuge. Christ, He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the narrow gate through which we must enter to partake in eternal life. The gravest mistake, the cruelest decision one could ever make, is to turn away from the Savior's outstretched hands. Jesus is the way. You cannot avoid Him. Jesus Christ is the only way. You have to do business with Him. The greatness and might of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the warrior in the Bible, more powerful than all the archangels combined. Let this truth resound in our hearts and ignite a fire of hope and strength within us. In the book of Revelation, we witness a glorious scene as John beholds the heavens open, and there stands Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. 
the title Lion of Judah evokes an image of power, majesty and authority. He is not a passive bystander, he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, leading us into victory. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last, the eternal one who has no beginning and no end. He is the great I am, the self-existent and all-sufficient one who stands before time and creation itself. He is the Ancient of Days whose wisdom and authority transcend the ages. He is the Word made flesh, dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. He is the light of the world, shining in the darkness, dispelling fear and bringing hope to the lost. He is the Good Shepherd, guiding his flock with tender care and protecting us from harm. He is the Bread of Life, satisfying the hunger of our souls with his nourishing truth. He is the Living Water, quenching the thirst of our hearts with his everlasting love. He is the resurrection and the life, conquering death and offering eternal life to all those who believe in him. He is the way, the truth and the life, the only path to the Father. He is the door, the entrance to salvation, through which we find abundant life and access to the Father's presence. He is the great physician, healing the brokenhearted and binding up our wounds. He is the comforter, consoling us in times of sorrow and filling us with peace that surpasses all understanding. He is the Redeemer, who paid the price for our sins with his precious blood. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the Justifier, declaring us righteous through faith in him. He is the Prince of Peace, bringing reconciliation between God and humanity. He is the Advocate, interceding on our behalf before the Father. Jesus is the way. You cannot avoid Him. Jesus Christ is the only way. You have to do business with Him. But it is not just the outright rejection of Christ that leads one to eternal peril. It is also the subtle undermining of His Word. Proverbs 13.13 13 illuminates this reality. Whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. The word of God is the compass by which we navigate this world. The wisdom enclosed in Proverbs 13.13 13 is not mere recommendation or casual advice. It's a divine decree, an eternal principle governing the moral universe. Revering the commandment is not about a mere outward display of religiousness. It's an inner transformation, a reconditioning of the heart that aligns our will with His divine will. When we honor His commandments, when we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, it brings forth a harvest of righteousness, a reward that is both temporal and eternal. Decision 3. Living in Unrepentant Sin the journey of our souls through the arena of this world is full of battles. Battles against the temptations and sins that entangle our steps. The Word of God resounds in Hebrews 10, 26 and 27 with a poignant warning. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Oh, this truth presses upon our hearts. It's a solemn reminder that living in unrepentant sin is not a fate thrust upon us. It is a choice, a continual, deliberate decision to walk contrary to the light of truth we've received. It's a daily rejection of the sanctity and the sanctifying power of the blood of Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, every act of willful sin is a step into the shadows, away from the radiant glory of our Redeemer. And choices, my brethren, have profound, echoing consequences. An unchanged life, a heart unmoved by the loving grace of God, speaks volumes of the absence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a barren land where the fruit of self-control does not flourish. Continual, deliberate sin 
is a shackle that binds the soul. It's a wall that separates us from the life-giving embrace of our Lord. But oh, what hope, what boundless grace is offered to us. While the breath of life still fills our lungs, while the light of day still graces our eyes, repentance is a door open before us, an avenue to return to the arms of our loving Father. The mercy of God is an ocean of endless depths, ready to engulf our sins and transgressions, ready to wash away the stains of our iniquities. It's never too late to turn, never too late to come back to the shepherd and guardian of our souls. Let us then hate sin, hate its deceitfulness, hate its monetary pleasures, hate its fleeting satisfactions. Sin is not our companion, it's our adversary. It's not our comforter, it's our accuser. Hate sin with a godly hatred. Despise its allure and avoid its traps. Embrace instead the loving commands of our Lord. Walk in the ways of His righteousness and find rest in your souls. The altar of God's mercy is not a place of condemnation, but of liberation. Not of judgment, but of grace. God's forgiveness is a divine decree of acquittal, a royal proclamation of our release from the bondage of sin. And, oh, how willing, how eager is our God to forgive, to restore, to rebuild the ruins of our lives. Children of God, the drums of eternity beat in every heartbeat. The sands of time slip swiftly through the hourglass of our existence. Do not harden your hearts. Do not let the deceitfulness of sin drag your souls into the abyss of eternal separation. Repent today. Turn your hearts to God today and experience the transforming power of His redeeming love today. Do not love sin. Hate it with a holy hatred. Do not live in sin. Flee from it and run into the loving embrace of our Savior. And let the echoes of eternity be the harmonious melodies of redemption and grace in our lives. 4 and 5 denying Christ before men and loving the world more than God. Our Lord Jesus, the eternal Word made flesh, speaks a truth of profound gravity in Matthew 10, 33, declaring, But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. This denial, oh, it's not just a fleeting whisper of betrayal. It's not merely a transient echo of abandonment as exemplified by Peter. It is a life steeped in the continuous, relentless denial of Christ. A life that negates the redemption and the identity found in the Son of God. It's a life that chooses, every day, to reject the glory and the love of our Savior, to suppress the truth of His resurrection power. And it's this choice, this decision, that reverberates through the chambers of eternity with consequences of eternal significance. It's a solemn reminder that our public profession of faith is not just a confession. It's a declaration of allegiance, a commitment to the one who bore our sins and our sorrows. 1 John 2.15 resonates with a clarion call to our hearts, admonishing, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. It's a powerful reminder, a spiritual beacon illuminating the path of our choices. The allure of the world is palpable. Its offerings of pleasure, of transient joys, beckon the soul with tempting whispers. But oh, it's a choice to love the world, to entwine our affections with the fleeting shadows of earthly delights. The Word of God punctuates the essence of our journey, urging us entreating us to not succumb to the ephemeral charms of the world. For to love the world is to estrange our hearts from the eternal love of the Father. It's to trade the eternal riches of His glory for the perishable treasures of the world. It's a choice that veils the soul in spiritual darkness, eclipsing the radiant light of God's eternal love. But let our hearts arise in reverent adoration of our Heavenly Father, let our lives be the harmonious symphonies of His eternal praises. Let us not be the echoes of denial, but the voices of affirmation, proclaiming the boundless love of Christ. 
Let our love for God transcend the allure of the world. Let it soar above the fleeting enchantments of earthly pleasures. Let our lives be anchored in the eternal, in the unchanging, in the unshakable kingdom of our God. Denying Christ and loving the world are decisions that etch shadows on our eternal destinies. But oh, the grace of God is an ever-flowing fountain, inviting us to drink from the waters of redemption, to feast on the bread of life. Let us choose Christ. Let us love the Father with an undivided heart, and let our choices be the reflections of His eternal light in this world and the world to come.